Well, friends, here it is. The day has finally come. Not only do we have ZBrush on the iPad, but the most anticipated feature we've all been waiting for. Those of us who were lovers of the ZBrush desktop app, what's that feature that was glaringly absent from ZBrush on the iPad before? That's right, Z Modeler. Z Modeler is out now. What, right after you watch this video, run, don't walk to your nearest app store and get the update to this amazing application. This, this feature alone is truly a nomad killer. Now, like I've said before, I'm glad that Nomad exists. You know, I'm glad that there is competition in the space. I think they'll continue to push each other, ZBrush and Nomad. But this feature right here, Z Modeler, is so powerful because it essentially brings desktop level modeling to the iPad. We've had some other programs like Valance 3D that have tried and, and are on the right track, but they're at kind of a crawl when it comes to features and um, optimized workflows for the iPad. Whereas ZBrush with the inclusion of Z Modeler is just amazing. I've really only spent about 10 minutes with it so far, but as someone who's come from the desktop version, I can tell you it is it seems to be full featured and they've even added some things that make it even better than what the you know, the desktop version was. So anyways, let's just jump in. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some kind of initial things that you can do with the modeler that make it so amazing. And then, you know, we'll move into an actual project, a real world use case example, if you will. So, you know, if you didn't notice while I was talking, I, uh, when I opened up ZBrush, I just chose the cube primitive. And so that's what you can see on my screen. Uh, it was set to have these poly frames, the wireframe on. So that's why maybe it looked a little different than how y'all uh, are used to seeing it. But uh, it is handy to have polyframe on, um, especially when using Z Modeler. So before we do anything with this, we want to go to our uh, drop down here, choose tool, and then go down to initialize. And then you have these Q cube, Q sphere, Q grid. These are kind of the best way to start with uh, Z Modeler. So I've got a resolution of two by two basically. So if I hit Q cube, it converts this into uh, you know two by two cube. And as I hover over it, you can see I've got the Z Modeler brush already activated. I'm going to put a heart on that because I'm just so happy that it is here. You know, it was awesome to have ZBrush before and I created some tutorials, but I kept finding myself running into walls where, man, if I only had Z Modeler, then I could do this thing. Well, the wait is over. The wait is over. So there's a few ways to access the features of the Z Modeler brush. So you'll see as I hover over, things, you know, things, uh, different elements, you know, face, edge, point, they, you know, will highlight. Oh, there you go. Just barely touched it and extruded. And you can see this line here on the face. There are certain features uh, that are directional. And so that's what that line indicates as to which way that will happen, that flow. Um, you don't really get a line on a uh, you know, edge because it is a line. So just know that whatever you do with the edge, uh, you know, like splitting it, inserting an edge loop, it's going to do that uh, perpendicularly, I believe is the term. 
point. Pretty self-explanatory, but you can see there are some kind of default brushes that are assigned. So move is assigned to point, which is so nice to just be able to grab one little point, move it around. You know, we're inside of ZBrush and, and we're trying to work low poly because maybe we want to use our model you know, on the web or in a low poly game or, or whatever, we can do that. Um, look at that, I added a bevel to the edge because I wasn't paying attention. And instead of grabbing the point, I selected the edge. So, um, and then like we saw earlier, if I touch the face, it extrudes multiple faces for some reason, right? So why is that? Okay, let's, undo, get back to a regular cube. And you can see that when you hover over uh, an element, it tells you what it is doing. So bevel edge loop, if I hold down this button, it gives me the edge actions. Um, and that kind of disappears when you let it go. So that can be kind of frustrating. But a new feature that was added was this layout, this ability to click those items over here. So here I've got edge, uh, face, and point or vertex. And it stays open so I can scroll around, see what's going on, and my finger doesn't get in the way because it is fat and it will definitely get in the way. Um, but you can see right now I'm on face, uh, it's on extrude, but it, you know, when I extrude something, it's extruding all of these. Well, what's unique about all of those is they're all polygroup and they're an island. So if there was a green polygroup over here, it wouldn't affect that if I had this mode selected because I've got it set to island. If I did polygroup all, it would affect anything with that polygroup. So that's kind of what, what's going on there. You also have a single poly, which is the default. So now if I go back here and extrude, it's just doing the one uh, polygon, right? And because we're in symmetry mo mode, of course, it's doing it on both sides of the X axis. Okay. Um, you know, let's go to our edge over here. And right now it's set to bevel and an edge loop complete. So what's a, an edge loop? That's, you know, loop of edges, right? So if I were to start beveling this, it's beveling that complete round. Now it's just a one poly bevel. So if I went back to here and I want to give it more than one row, I can do that here up to eight. Um, Two, let's see what that looks like. Whoop. So you gotta be careful because sometimes it picks maybe a different loop than what you were expecting. There we go. So play, with, play around with that, figure it out. You can see there it's added more geometry, but maybe rather than wanting it to be linear, we want it to be a soft, right? transition, which would give us more of a bevel as opposed to a chamfer. Come on. Okay. Now, I expected it to be a little different, but I've been wrong before. <laughs> um, all right, well, how would you do a rounded bevel. See, this is real. This is real world, folks. You know, I'm not Mr. I have all the answers. I happen to have some experience with these tools, but by no means do I have all the answers. So that's something to play with. Why is it still doing more of a chamfer as opposed to a a rounded bevel. 
So we'll come back to that, but that's one of those things that maybe it's always done it uh, and I haven't really paid attention because it does so many other things just so, so well. Another nice thing about this working low poly and with the modeler is you can activate your dynamic subdivision, which is kind of like you are familiar with sub D modeling. So click that and you can see now it's applying tension to all of, you know, the geometry. And these little orange floating points are where the points originally were, or, you know, and they're still there, but thanks to the subdivision application there, it's rounding it out. So you can see that even though we're working low poly here and it's easy to update, we've got a preview of something that's higher poly. And of course you can add more levels of subdivision right there. See that? Look at that, super smooth. But the beautiful thing is we're still dealing with the same underlying amount of geometry. So now if you're super familiar with 3D, you know, you know all about that, it's no big deal. But for those of you who are newer and maybe coming from Nomad, uh, this is some cool, cool stuff. Uh, you know, I could go to, and I could be in this mode here. I don't have to be in the polyframe view, but I could, instead of be extrude, I could make it move. And these are my transform options. See, this is another nice thing that it, that the newest version of ZBrush, I haven't tried the latest desktop version, but they've split these up into these color coded sections because in the past it was kind of like alphabetical and you had to read through a bunch of stuff. So that's really nice. So now I can just grab this face, move it along. And you can see it's moving it along the normal, but if I hold down my alt button, it'll move it, should move it. Direction I lied. Which one is it? There we go. This one, yeah. So what's that? The shift button, I believe. So there you go. The standard, you know, operation is for stuff to move along the normal, but if you want to move it directionally, hold down shift. So pretty powerful, you know, and that becomes even more powerful when we're dealing with the ver vertices here. Um, oh. A little dangerous to try to move vertices when you're not in polyframe. There we go. And vertices aren't tied to the same normal direction because normals, you know, are related to faces. Kind of like if there was a point coming directly out of the face, that's your normal. Whoop, there I go. So you'll find sometimes that you maybe unintentionally grab an edge instead of a point or a face instead of a point or whatever. Uh, that happens, obviously. We have the undo buttons button. Um, but if you decided like, hey, I'm just moving points. I don't want to accidentally mess things up by hitting a face or an edge. Well, guess what? Go into face mode and make your action set it to none. Where is it at? Do nothing, yes. Do nothing. Same thing with edge mode. We're gonna go down to do nothing. So now, this way, I don't accidentally 
move things around. The only thing that's going to move are these points. And my viewfinder. The camera or whatever. So look at that. That's just, I mean, we're just barely, barely scratching the surface of what Z Modeler can do. And it's exciting. I'm super stoked. So get in there, play around. You've got all this stuff. Um, let me, you know, I feel like maybe I've glossed over stuff too quickly. Um, let me show you one other handy thing. So QMesh is pretty fun. It, it's kind of multi-functional. So let's go ahead and turn off our dynamic subdivision. Uh, look at that. <laughs> um, and it is the nice thing about dynamic subdivision is you can just turn it back on and off. No problem. No problem. Um, but yeah, QMesh, I've got it set to the face, does some different things. So if you just click on it and start to drag, you're going to get extrusion. Okay, great. Now, if I were to click on it, start to do that and pick shift, look, it's moving the face. It's not extruding it, it's moving it along the uh, normal. So. Here we are in QMesh, but we're able to do multiple things. Okay. Next thing is let's grab it, hold down Alt, and then look at this. It's like subtracting away. Maybe you're you want to get rid of some extrusions that you did. There you go. Um, what else we got? Yeah, here holding down control, it extracts, you know, it just basically clones. It's kind of like shifty in um, Blender, where I'm able to clone that shape and pull it right off of the, uh, the main model there. And then this is nice because now I can give it some thickness. And it's the exact same. You know dimensions as as this piece behind it, so you can imagine how powerful that can quickly get. You know, let's do it again. Start to move, hold down Control, and boom, we've got it again. We're gonna extrude it out. So pretty pretty powerful, and this is extremely dumb <laughs> looking what I've got here. Uh, so. You know, I know it's not anything too inspiring. So what I'm going to do is, I, you know, I want to get this out there to my people as quick as possible so you can start playing with uh, ZModeler. There are other new features. This is all about ZModeler. Go play with it. And then by the time you're done playing with it a little bit, I will have had a chance to maybe put together this, the first episode of building this little cartoon car inside of ZBrush on the iPad, thanks to ZModeler. So until next time, my friends, just keep on creating. That's, that's why we're here. Cheers.